Okay. Um, I don't have much time, but I don't have that much content either, so that's probably fine. My name is Matthew Garrett. Uh, I work for. A, uh, hang on, where is next slide? There is next slide. Uh, I work for Aurora. We make autonomous trucks. I'm not going to be talking about that. Uh, oh, sorry. That is maybe a little small, but the trucks have a lot of tech in them. It's not particularly consistent. We, at the moment, have x86, we have ARM, we have very low-level embedded stuff, and there was a, a desire to try to make the security as consistent. Like, we don't want to have to deal with very different secure boot models for every single component in the system. And we decided that rather than try to get UEFI everywhere, um, we instead decided to try to make UEFI systems look like embedded systems. So. This is something that we've achieved by moving to U-Boot, which many of you are probably very familiar with U-Boot. Most of you who are using U-Boot are probably using it in a very embedded environment. It's typically something which you run on systems that don't provide their own firmware interface. You're running U-Boot basically as part of the hardware bring up, and then it's providing a consistent interface. It has support for loading um, kernels, um, things from like, they're called FIT images. It's a I can't remember what that stands for, but basically a blob that contains kernel, uh, device tree blob, and in at RamFS, that sort of stuff, all as one image, and then it has support for signing those. So we decided to use that as the basis for Secure Boot everywhere. Uh, it does also support on embedded devices providing a UEFI environment. And for those of you who are familiar with U-Boot, who use U-Boot involving UEFI, it's probably UEFI providing a UEFI environment so that distros can basically ship a standardized boot environment and then just make use of a board-specific U-Boot to provide the generic firmware interface. We're doing it the other way around. Uh, U-Boot has support for running as a UEFI application, so it then makes use of the UEFI firmware interface. This is originally added by Google in 2015. It's kind of a minimal viable implementation. People have been working on this a bit and recently added support for this as a 64-bit application rather than just a 32-bit one. Um, but basically, this allows you to run U-Boot, run it on the firmware in the UEFI environment, and then it can work as if basically you're bringing up U-Boot on an embedded device. So we wanted this to basically, um, as it existed, it basically allowed you to treat a UEFI environment as an embedded platform. You jumped into the legacy entry point in the kernel, and that meant that you didn't have access to any UEFI runtime services. Uh, it meant that the kernel EFI stub wasn't run, which also meant that things like the TPM event log weren't copied up from the firmware into the runtime environment. And we wanted all of that. So uh, we wanted to be able to have proper handoff to the kernel UEFI stub entry point. We wanted the ability to use UEFI level drivers and functionality. So we could do things like TPM measurements and have that be part of the firmware event log. So that would be passed up to the kernel appropriately. And we wanted to avoid hardware specific config. We wanted to be able to distribute something that would work on multiple different generations, which use different firmware, which were produced by different board vendors, that kind of thing. So the third part of this, handoff support, uh, we needed to um, basically extend the bootm command so that it had support for the kernel UEFI entry point. And Right now, our implementation is using the legacy UEFI entry points in the kernel as opposed to using the PECOF entry point and the load file 2 stuff. So we're still constructing a boot param structure by hand. And there's an open question as to whether we should be uh, updating that. Turns out it's kind of a moderate amount of additional code that brings us no benefit. But there's also been noises about a desire to deprecate the legacy entry point. And so I think that's a trade-off of um, how much win is there in this case, especially because the init RamFS is not coming from the file system, it's coming from the fit image. So basically, we just have an extra copy of the init RamFS for no benefit there. Uh, but yeah, this also means that U-Boot's not calling exit boot services. It means that that responsibility is being delegated back to the kernel. So we have basically the same functionality that you would have if you were booting with a traditional grub or um, system deboot environment. We also added drivers for um, basically using the UEFI network interface, using the UEFI TPM drivers, so we didn't need to care about the precise hardware details of the board we're booting on. Uh, fixed a couple of bugs in the block driver and also just hooked up support for UEFI variables so we can read UEFI variables in the U-Boot boot script and then make stuff conditional based on that. Uh, yeah, um, 
This is basically a weirdness about U-Boost. When you load an image, you're supposed to provide an address that it can be loaded at. And normally that's fine because U-Boost typically is targeting specific hardware builds and you know what your memory map is like. That doesn't work so well on UEFI because the memory map can depend on system configuration. It can also depend on whether it's a cold boot or a warm boot. An address that's available at one point may be being used by the firmware at another point. And this is going to get worse as uh, vendors start implementing more ASLR in UEFI. So uh, the way that we dealt with this was just to add a command that looks at a file and then tells you what finds an address it can be loaded at, sets a variable to that, and then you can use that in the load command. This feels like a terrible solution. There has to be a better one, but um, that's something where I'm going to need to engage with uh, U-Boot upstream to figure out whether there's a cleaner approach there. Um, where's the code? It should be on the main list now, but it isn't because I fell asleep. <laughs> anyway, uh, questions about that. Does this seem useful to anyone else? Uh, how much effort should I put into upstreaming this? So how, how much commonality is there between the, the boot path when you're, when you're using this on x86 using bootm uh, where, versus EFI on ARM and other platforms where we've got the boot EFI command and it's a, a slightly different path? Can, do you see ways that that could be unified and we're actually doing the same thing across the board? I think on the ARM implementation, the boot EFI is, um, that's where uBoot is providing the UEFI implementation. Um, yes. but then, and then you're handing off support to something else. There's some code that's currently in EFI underscore loader that could be moved into common space um, that would make that slightly easier. Uh, the amount of additional code added for this is actually pretty minimal, but some of that is because I'm using the x86 legacy entry points. Um, if we were to do it with the, uh, the more modern PECOF type thing, then that would probably be a case of try to drag the modern code out there. But trying to integrate that with BootM it's a little bit awkward, but maybe the answer there is, as you say, stop using Boosem um, yeah. and just have that all in Boost EFI. But Boost EFI doesn't, at the moment, I think, consume fit. It's more intended to boost an EFI executable. So no, that, yeah. what we want is to do the fit validation. So we want to do all the uh, signature validation stuff there, pull device tree info out of there. And so there's kind of a tension in our needs. Um, moving that into UEFI space would mean U-Boot becomes a useful UEFI bootloader, but it doesn't then allow us to make a UEFI system look like an embedded system, Yeah, which is what we're trying to do, which is, I understand, almost certainly not what most people want. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like Marta's presentation, which is the next one, would might be interesting here as well. Yep. Too, so. It's super cool. You should upstream it and I'll probably use it. Uh, it's a missing piece, really. Like you say, this was done years ago, I think, for network switches at Google, and I don't, I haven't really heard of other people using it. I have absolutely um, no idea what the desired goal was at Google. Um, it was I just for booting when I was still working there. Booting uh, U-boot on an Intel uh, okay, net network switch sense. because it came with UEFI. But um, yeah, it's it's. Can you go back to the slide? Um, Oh, yeah. Um, the memory map thing, I think, you know, you need to be able to, U-Boot relocates itself. That all needs to be, you know, find the biggest area mm -hmm. to relocate to. That, that, does, that wouldn't be hard to so tidy that, up. So that, I think, is already fine. Uh, U-Boot okay. is not, uh, is not uh, there is code to copy the UEFI memory map into U-Boot's memory map before it relocates itself, so that is being dealt with. But then the, the load command doesn't have a find a region for this. Yeah, so there's an LMB feature, um, memory, block, memory block thing, and if you set that up correctly, you can then allocate memory from that. Yeah, that's actually what we've ended up doing. Uh, well, that's, that's fine, that's perfect then. Uh, but then if I do load file name and then I need to pass an address, there, yeah, yeah. then I don't know what address to pass. You, um, you use standard boot and it'll get easier, but we can okay. talk on the mailing list. Yeah. yeah, I'll bring this up on the mailing list. Uh, so I think we're at time, but I don't know if you want one more. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have, I have been involved in a number of projects where we did it, but with Bearbox. So Bearbox also has support for running an as AFI payload. And we did it mostly to be able to configure watchdogs and to have like a redundant way to store information without using EFI variables because their quality different. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it's uh, Kraut and Rüben, they say in German. It's not very consistent. 
so why do you use uh, on I assume this is on x86 mm -hmm. so why do you use U-boot so what is uh, uh, we're using U-boot on the arm we have a okay. heterogeneous environment uh, there's a bunch of arm systems and there's some x86 as well and U-boot was the simplest thing that would give us a common denominator across all of those but uh, so you have a secure boot chain going and yeah. UEFI secure boot chain on x86 UEFI secure boot chains to U-boot on the arm devices then whatever the SOC vendors secure boot thing chains to U-boot and then U-Boot then verifies the fit signature in the same way on both. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, we will start our uh, micro-conference at noon. Thanks a lot for joining us.